I don't know about you guys, but I woke up to my wife working in the kitchen. She said, of course she did. Of course I did. How many, how many of you guys woke up to, this, to sights and sounds and smells? You know, I, I, like the, I like the sights and smells of Easter. I, I always have. When I was a kid, it was, yeah, Lord, I'm dating myself. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm fixing to talk about. How many of y'all know when I say patent leather what I'm even talking about? All right, so yeah, so patent leather. I, I grew up with patent leather when I was a kid and, and pastels. And, and, you know, I remember I had my picture made in a purple shirt when I was a kid. And look here, all things come back. So I'm wearing my Easter shirt. How many of y'all wearing new clothes for Easter? Me too. There's three or four of us anyway. So I love uh, vinegar. I can't think about vinegar or smell vinegar without going to Easter. Y'all do that too? Does anybody still dye Easter eggs? No, nobody still dies each day. Ain't that just a tragedy? Y'all, it made such a mess. But the kids had so much fun. So I just, you know, like, like Brother Espy was talking about, I love Christmas. I like the sights. I love, like the sounds. It's the fun, the music and all that. But Easter still holds kind of a special tradition in, in many of our lives. It, it does in mine, um, from going to Mamma and Papa's house to hunting Easter eggs, because you could rest assured it was going to be a hard-boiled egg at Mamma's house in a pine tree in the front yard. Y'all know what I'm... Did you, any of y'all? I mean, come on, y'all. We ain't that different. So there's some... It's going to be an Easter egg here, and there's going to be one in the azaleas, and it's just going to be... It's just going to be a ton of fun. Everybody's going to be there. It's going to be loud. It's going to be messy. It's going to be noisy. And then and then somebody's going to go to sleep, and it was always Peppa. <laughs> and so I appreciate you being out on an early, early Easter morning. It is really good to see you. If you're a guest, we hope that you find yourself comfortable here with us today. Of course, we are here to celebrate a risen Savior and empty tomb. Um, I'm going to read from a couple of scriptures and just make a few comments. But how many of you know if the tomb, uh, Romans 6, you can go ahead and turn over there. How many of you know that if the tomb is empty, then his resurrection was real and your resurrection awaits? If the tomb is empty, then the power of death has been forevermore and completely broken. If the, if the tomb is empty, then salvation is found in none other. If the tomb is empty, then righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost belongs to you. If the tomb is empty, then Christianity is far more than religion. If, if the tomb is empty, then disease has been deprived of its final say. If the tomb is empty, then every pain is temporary. If the tomb is empty, then grace overwhelms sin every single time. If the tomb is empty, then heaven is your real home. If the tomb is empty, then Jesus is alive. And if Jesus is alive, then so are you. Oh, I was I was hoping for a little bit bigger response than that, so I'll I'll try to do better. Turn to Romans chapter six, verse four, and we're going to read. Oh, it's, she's already got it up there for you. We're just going to read these few verses together and see how the how the Lord leads. Uh, typically on Easter, I re, I recount the story of the death, burial, and resurrection. And I was as I was studying it the first of the week, getting my mind around all that. I just kept uh, coming back to one scripture that has to do with it, but not a part of the gospel account. So join me in Romans chapter six, verse four says, "Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death." Therefore, I'm buried with him through baptism into death. That's typified by water baptism, but not just what that's talking about. That like as Christ was raised up from dead by the glory of the Father, so the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So Jesus was raised from the dead. We know by the Holy Ghost, by the power of God. Then uh, we should also walk in newness of life. So Easter represents a new life. It's, it's not just death and gloom and despair and pain and blood and darkness anymore, then Easter is a time when we celebrate all things being made new. That way we can, when we say, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, sweetheart, we mean I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. If the tomb is empty, then all things are made new, and I have a new life. I, it may not look 
look like it on the outside, but it sure was that on the inside. Can I get a testimony from somebody Jesus is saved? Verse 5 says, For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, then we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Oh my gosh! Then his resurrection is my resurrection. And we're going to skip down to verse 11. It says, Likewise reckon yourself also to be dead. Excuse me. Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive. So what, am I, what is my relationship with sin? Say, I'm dead to it. I'm dead to it. I am dead to sin. It has no power over me. It's got no hold on over me. If Jesus walked out of that tomb, then the same power that dwells in him dwells in me, and I'm dead to it just like Jesus is. Likewise, I reckon I'm dead to sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm alive. I'm alive on the inside. I was dead, but now I'm alive. So turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and this is where we're going to hang out in Ephesians chapter 2. I just wanted to lay that groundwork there in Romans chapter 6 for you. So if I said something in a minute that you didn't understand, you'd know that's what I was talking about. So let me turn over here to Ephesians chapter 2. We are going to take communion together in a little while. We practice open communion here. That means if you've been saved, you can participate. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to read beginning in verse 1. I may just, I'm going to read this whole text if you'll bear with me. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once c conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, I love this. I love this. It's like he's just putting all the black paint on the wall. Just putting it. He's just painting this black background. And all of a sudden, uh, the, the great apostle turns around. And he says, but listen, God. I mean, this was, this was my condition once. He said, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy. Oh, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I can't hardly wait. Because of his great love uh, with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved. I'm telling you, this is powerful stuff. And then he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. How many of you know this verse? For by grace you have been saved through faith, that, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I'm so glad, I'm so glad verse 9 is in the Bible. Not of works lest anyone should boast. I'm so glad it wasn't up to me, sister. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's pray one more time, and, and I'll just share what I believe the Lord would have us to share this morning, and uh, we'll see the direction that the, that the Lord would lead as we go. Father, we thank you so much for your word. The entrance of it gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. It makes crooked places straight. It's manna from heaven. It nourishes our souls. We pray that our hearts would be fertile and good ground for your word to be sown into, that we might leave this place today full and happy but also bearing fruit for your kingdom god i pray for every guest especially that we have today god that you would open their hearts that you would pour out a blessing upon them that they'll be glad that they got up and got dressed and came to early morning service today father bless our new friends in jesus name amen we look at this text as a whole, we see that God's enemy and ours, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, sought us out to kill us and kill us it most certainly did. When sin was conceived and born, innocence was lost and death moved into our hearts to stay forever. Once dead, it was easy to live carnally. Once sin, by the occasion of the flesh, took control of me, so maybe I'll just talk about myself for a minute. Once sin found its home in my heart and carnality won out, then it was easy for me to be manipulated by these spirits that, that the apostle was just talking about. Uh, all he had to do was, was put a thought in my mind, a lust in my flesh, and I was off to the races. 
Y'all are awful quiet. I guess it was just me. Maybe that didn't happen to you. See, the dead will go, will go so far as to become convinced that they deserve whatever they want and they're willing to sacrifice anyone and anything to get it. That's what dead people to do. See, sin killed me. Sin killed me. It brought only despair and destruction and all that was good to, to all that was good in my life. There was no escaping its carnal over, it was, there was no escaping its power over my carnal nature. It showed no mercy. It found its home in my head and in my heart. Killed my spirit, ruined my soul. I became an easy target for the demon spirits who manipulated my thinking, speaking, and doing. Once I was dead, it was really easy to convince me to live for myself and myself alone. Following the wide and easy path, I was caught up in a current of lies and didn't see the way out. But I know it wasn't just me. But God... But God, this is the sum, the summation and the sum total of our new relationship with sin. We are dead to sin and alive to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The same life that Jesus has, we have. His, his life transformed us, spirit, soul, and body, and has given us a new and living hope. I'm going to go back to verse 4 and hang out here for just a second because it starts with, But God who is rich in mercy. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love where he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us, deli- made us alive together with Christ by grace if you've been saved. And so some years ago, oh, oh, 25 now, maybe almost 30, I, l- I had to look up what this idea of God being rich in mercy was. So I, I, I searched definitions of mercies, not, f- not from Webster, but from, from theologians because I wanted the Bible to, de- to describe the Bible or define the Bible to me and the best one I ever found that landed in my heart and it stayed all these years mercy is the manifestation of pity that's what it is it assume, it mercy makes an assumption and I know those sometimes are dangerous but it assumes need on the part of the person that receives it but also resources adequate to meet or overwhelm the need on the person on the part of the person who shows it so let me let me let me let, let me break this down that means when god looks at us he's not walking around with his cosmic sw- fly swatter he looks at you looking for for weaknesses that you have so that he can show himself strong on your behalf that's what the old testament talks about when it says that god looks down from heaven looking for someone whose heart is at peace with him so he can show himself strong on that person's behalf so this morning each one of us this morning can celebrate that we are the our life our new lives are the product of his mercy and his grace. Now we can say, listen, God looked on our frame. He knew who we are. He, knew, he knows how we are. And, and what he decided to do about it was release a certain amount of power on, in, in that cross and through that cross so that that power could come upon you and change anything and everything that needed changing. That, that the dead man could come to life. That the mean man could be a nice man. The, the sick man could be a whole man. Mercy, it, it means that God has all the power and the resources adequate. He'll never run out of loving kindness and tender mercies how many of you knew that they were new this morning when you got out of bed fresh as the fallen dew sweeter than manna from heaven i mean his mercies i depend on mercy don't you i think we ought to celebrate mercy for a minute today that when i deserve judgment god loved me and showed me mercy instead when i deserve to die in the pain of my sin in the anguish of my soul he came and did something about it and i know it wasn't just me in the house this morning that that got up from a time of prayer or a moment spent in the presence of god and you realized something had changed and it had changed for the better and it had changed forever how many of you can testify to that with me there's three or four of us in the room that knows mercy changed everything when you knew you deserved the punishment of sin but mercy came calling and found you instead come on i know it's early for all this but it's all right y'all just bear with me god's attitude towards the drifter the renegade the victim and her tormentor alike has been made clear He has made the way for each of us to turn to him for mercy and find pure and perfect love. We we have discovered that the world will show them none. 
It devours life and destroys hope. The world leaves people as empty shells of who God made them to be. It is love and mercy that will cause the deserts to bloom, the wildernesses to be tamed. It is only love that can prompt the demoniac to preach hope to the hopeless. He loved us. He loved me when I was nothing but a sinner separated and dead. When we were cursing his name, rebelling against his plans, and running as far and as fast as we could away from the cross, he still loved us purely and perfectly. It was the hope of his love that led me to repent, to change my ways, to seek and to serve him with all the strength that I can muster. Verse 6 says, He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kingdom towards us in Christ Jesus. Listen, you, 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 you haven't seen it yet because my body still stands here, but I have not only been crucified with Christ Jesus, I am alive together with Him just as surely today, and it's just as real to me, it's just as real to me and my God as if it had already happened. It's like God looks down from heaven and he sees what is and already was as as having happened. Say, explain that to me. I can't really. All I know for sure is I was dead, but now I am alive. That the power that death had over me has been broken. I'm no longer afraid of it like I used to be. All I know is that Jesus walked out of that tomb and I'm going to, too. When Jesus ascended at the right hand of God and sat down in the heavenly realm, I did, too. I found my place of rest and completion. We can walk in new life, new power, and new possibilities because the Holy Ghost has quickened us and made us alive together with Christ Jesus. This new life will certainly include the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. We put, we put off the old man. We put on the new man. The implication, of course, is that a changed lifestyle uh, brought about by new ways of thinking and new ways of being changes absolutely everything. There's a transformation. There's a washing of the water of the Word of God. See, the exceeding riches of His grace and His overwhelming kindness towards me compels me forward when I'm tired, weakened by the battles, ready to throw in the towel. I can't quit because Jesus never quit. Hmm. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Hmm. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. I think verse 9 is in there to kind of keep the religious demons at bay. Those people that are kind of prone to self-righteousness kind of hang out in this verse for a minute, and they just come to realize that it really wasn't about me, it's all about him. Maybe we'll talk about that for just a minute. I didn't do it for myself. He did it for me. The flip side of that is you didn't do it for yourself either. It wasn't any good thing that you did that caused Jesus to smile upon you that day and show you mercy and kindness. As a matter of fact, the idea of mercy and kindness is that you do not deserve it because if it would not be mercy or kindness if it was earned or deserved. So by their very definition, it means I wasn't a good enough boy. Now, if you'll be a good boy, Jesus will love you. I'm glad that thought didn't, didn't take root forever in my heart and in my mind. I know that he loved me no matter what. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Salvation. Have you been saved? Somebody testify that you were saved. God's great gift to those who will come to him in childlike faith that will just accept the, the simple facts of, of this morning's message, of the imagery that you see uh, that we have up from the He is risen to from death to life to the crosses on the outside of the tomb, the, the, the images that you see in the foyer and the church, and all, all these things, they, they speak to our souls, and they remind us that it is the grace of God that released salvation into the heart of men. 
I, I don't know that I can ever, I, I, obviously you can tell I can't adequately explain it, though I have been studying it for years. I, 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 I may not can ever get my mind around it. However, that does not preclude me from standing in awe of it. So I've seen a lot of things in the natural that I can't, I can't use words to describe. I, I showed a picture a few weeks ago of Niagara Falls. And, and the truth of the matter is, unless you've been standing there before and you've seen that water come pouring off of those cliffs and, and hit that ground and you've, and you've seen how that mist just does and the lights and the colors and the, and the rainbows and you hear the roar and you feel the breeze, it's hard to use words to describe that. Unless you stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon and just went. I don't have words to describe how you feel when you're standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. All I know is that when I stand on the edge of grace and I look out at it, God is good and his mercy endures forever seems insufficient. But it may be all I got. God's love is grand. It's, 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 it's magnificent. And when you taste and see that it's good, it, it, there'll, be a, there'll be a time in your life when that will be the only thing that will feed your soul. There are instances and moments when it's either God or it's nothing. And you can rest assured God is always there in that moment. And I am so grateful that he is. That he did not leave me dead in the sin and trespass. And when he, when he looked at me, on that, y'all have heard me tell this, I remember sitting there. I know where I was. I know what I was doing. And I know how my life was. And I am so grateful that in that moment, when I turned to him, hope came alive again. See, I was hopeless and helpless, and, 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 and I would say without God, but I had just enough in me to remember that God was good when I wasn't. And that if anything was going to help, it was going to be the Lord. I wasn't thinking about religion in church. I wasn't thinking about paying my tithes and being faithful. I was looking for an escape from the pain. I was looking for God to re rescue me because the truth of the matter is I couldn't rescue myself. I was in perfect pain and desperate soul. And Jesus was there with me in that moment. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. It's really interesting. The I'm trying not to say juxtaposition. The, the conflict, the, the pull of not of works, lest anyone should boast, to created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so you can't have one without the other. And so if I, if I spend, you know, five minutes saying it wasn't anything good that you did that caused him to love you and to pour his grace and mercy out on you, I can't help but to say once you have tasted and seen his goodness, once you have experienced a mercy that tra transcends your ability to put into words and to clearly articulate like I'm struggling with now, once you taste that, once you see that, once you have an experience with that, you can't help but put your hand to the gospel plow. Because the truth of the matter is those who have been washed in the blood, who have been cleansed, who, who, who have had an experience with grace and mercy, then they start looking around going, where's my cross? I know there's one around here somewhere. Where's that thing at? There's a, there's a work for me to do. There's, there's something I know that he didn't save me just for me to live a life of ease and vacation. I know that he created me for purpose and dignity and honor, and that's what I'm fixing to do with the rest of my life. I'm going to look around and find something to put my hands to. I'm going to mow the grass. I'm going to vacuum the floor. I'm going to paint the wall. I'm going to teach the kids. I'm going to tell somebody at Walmart. I'm going to pass out tracks. I'm going to invite strangers. I'm going to do whatever I got to do so that everybody I come in contact with sees hope in my eyes. And I'm not going to be lazy about it either. I'm going to diligently serve him. I'm going to diligently seek him out. I'm going to do for him what he did for me. And that is give him everything because he withheld nothing from me. Come on, somebody. 
Understand what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about serving him out of duty. I'm talking about serving him out of appreciation that he rescued our lives from a pit of destruction and despair. I'm talking about putting our hands, our minds, our hearts, our lives to something because he didn't save us to just sit around and do what I call diddly squat. See, if we're going to get excited about but God, and we should, and we rightfully should, then I believe we should also get excited about God saying, now here, how many of y'all ever gave, God gave some marching orders to before? Now, there's, there's enough of us in here we know what we're talking about. Uh, moved across the country once, didn't you? Sometimes you just got to give everything up because that's what Jesus did. And I didn't say nothing about it being fun. I didn't say nothing about it being comfortable. Carl and I had to walk away from a life that we thought was just perfect one time. I had to do it more than once. You just sometimes have to do that because that's what God re expects. Now, I don't think he expects that from everybody, and he doesn't expect it all the time. However, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when I was dead in my sin and my trespasses, even when I was hopeless and miserable, when I didn't know come here from Sikkim and I couldn't see, see up for down or any, any of these other metaphors or analogies you need, when I was that broken, hopeless sinner boy that was 26 or 27 years old, I have to go back and do the math, I don't remember. But better 30 than 36 or 46 or 56. Even when I was broken, I had, had a wife and two kids, and, and it was just a train wreck. Even when it was a train wreck, God showed me mercy. Because that's when I needed it the most. However, it has been my experience over the last few weeks I've needed it again. One of the cool things about mercy is that when you've tasted it, it's easier to extend to others. As a matter of fact, people that have tasted mercy and it's fresh in your mouth, it is just a natural thing to do. Oh, when you taste mercy every morning, Lord, be merciful to me and rescue me, a sinner. Then when mercy then makes a demand on you out of the lives of others, it can flow. But if we don't get up and taste new mercy every morning, then instead of mercy being the outflowing of our heart, it's something else entirely. This sermon is not about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to rejoice that God looked on us and showed us mercy. We're going to rejoice that we are indeed God's great workmanship, his handiwork, no less so than these wonders of creation that I've already mentioned. Made in the image of your creator, you have the capacity for glory and grace and, and all the goodness that God has designed and designated just for you. I believe... I believe when all these things begin to come together in our mind and in our lives, then we can find the strength necessary to move ever forward and press into and there abide in the perfect will of God. It is my prayer for you this morning that God will himself show you the way forward into his service. I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, I've already told you once, we practice open communion. All I ask is that based upon my understanding of Scripture, that it's, it's actually pretty dangerous to participate in communion if you're not saved. Uh, I remember, I'll never forget doing this a few years ago in Hope, and, and there was a, a young guy, about 30, and, and I read this about, you know, we'd judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged, and, and that guy wouldn't take communion. He ran to me as soon as church was over. I, for never, I will never forget Justin running to me. Tears in his eyes, I said, Preacher, i got to be saved. And he had his communion, his hand was just a shaking. And so he got saved on the platform, took communion, and everything changed for him that day. 
Aren't you grateful that everything can change just as we take communion? It's that, that my sermon, a little bit different for an Easter sermon. But I just wanted us to see, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. I wanted us to have an experience with mercy this week. I want you to have an experience with mercy. So that when, when God makes a demand through the lives of somebody else, I mean, you know, that's how that usually works, right? Through somebody else's weakness, God makes a demand on the mercy that he's already shown you. So when you have an opportunity to, to, give, to show mercy this week, that you remember because God has shown you mercy that you can show others mercy too. That you can be gracious and kind because your Father in heaven is gracious and kind. That you can be forgiving and loving, thank you fellas, because your Father in heaven is forgiving and loving. That you have this echo in your mind. I, I believe somebody that heard this message this morning is going to go back and you're going to study this but God verse a little bit more. You're going to see the, 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 the beautiful that shines through the darkness. Even when we were dead, dead in our sins and our trespasses, God loved us. Aren't you grateful that he loves the unlovable? I'm so grateful he loves the unlovable. I'm so grateful that he looks on the, on the inner man and not on the outer, outer guy. If we would stop looking at the outer guy, we'd be quick, a little bit slower to judge, you know, what's going on in somebody's life. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 now that you've been served. This, of course, is uh, Paul writing to the church. He's setting some things in order. And uh, verse 23 says, For I received of the Lord uh, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we're going to take the bread and we're going to give thanks to him for his broken body. Will you do that with me this morning? Take the bread. Jesus, we're very grateful in this room that you didn't wait for us to straighten up and fly right. You didn't wait for us to get our, all of our ducks in a row. You, you didn't wait for us to clean up our lives before you loved us. You loved us when we were a mess, when we were lost and undone, when we were sinners. You loved us when we were at our absolute worst. And you showed it to us as you left Gethsemane's garden and made your way to that cruel cross on Golgotha's hill. Thank you, Jesus for bearing my shame. Thank you, Jesus, for every, every stripe you received on your back. Thank you for enduring to the end so that we might be saved. Verse 25 says, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This cup, this, this juice represents nothing less than the blood of Jesus. So as we drink the juice together, somehow, some way in God's economy, we not only preach his, his death and resurrection, but we, we stake our claim to our share in it. Let's take the juice together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your blood. It washes away every stain. Oh, it purifies us. It makes us holy. It gives us hope. It is by nothing less than the blood of God that we are saved. Lord, we are in awe that you would be willing to shed even one drop for the wickedness that we have we, we, we lived and we have seen. But you poured out it all so that we might could be made whole and well. Lord Jesus, I'm very grateful to you for a rich and free salvation. 
I'm very grateful to you that you didn't leave me like you found me, but you restored hope to me and gave me a future. Lord, I pray a blessing, a blessing over everyone that's here today. You watch over them in Jesus' name. Now, guys, that's the end of my sermon, but I still want to pray. Perhaps there's someone in this room today, because I don't know everybody, and you say, listen, I need, I, I feel strongly about this. And you say, listen, I need God to show me mercy and save me. I need God to show me mercy and heal me. I need God to show me mercy and restore something to me that the devil has stolen or I've lost or walked away from. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Say, Lord, I need mercy today. I don't, I don't know. I just felt strongly this week that I wanted to talk about mercy for a little while today. Starting at the first of the week, it's like I just believed that this was a week for mercy. If you need God to show you mercy, would you just raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you. Nobody. Nobody needs mercy today but me and Andrea. Okay, sister, there's a few. Yeah, all right. So, Father, I, I thought maybe there's more than one person that might need mercy. Lord, right now, for these that have raised their hands and they say, I listen, I'm going to be honest with you, preacher, and I'm going to be honest with you, God. I need mercy. I need God to show me mercy. Lord Jesus, I pray that you are not only the God of, of love, but you're also the God of mercy and compassion. So I ask you to be merciful and kindness to them, that you look upon them with pity and you release the resources of heaven into their situations and into their circumstances, the situations and circumstances of their lives that put them in a place to find mercy and need mercy. I pray, God, that that, that is exactly what begins to overwhelm, that just as grace overwhelms sin, mercy overwhelms need. God, pour mercy out upon them, I pray in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I thank you for every person that was here, who is still here. <laughs> thank you that they are a gift to me in no small way. I pray, God, that as we uh, move uh, this portion of our service over to the next room, God, that you'd bless the cooks, mm. and you'd bless our food, you bless our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen.